Good morning to everyone of you all and uh, it's really heartening to see the audience coming in large numbers to attend this important conference on pediatric infection disease. And I hope you all are enjoying the scientific uh, layout that we held up in this conference for you. Without much ado, I'll go into the most important topic that we have of drug resistance. We've already had topics on drug resistance, fungal and drug resistant bacterial infections. And now we are going to go on to drug resistant TB in China. Over the years, we've seen TB really increasing uh, in the past few years. And what I used to manage TB earlier without wearing a mask or without any, uh, you know, not real uh, ventilation in the ovary. Now I get a point that we have real ventilation in the ovary. The you know, residents are wearing a mask because resistance to TB is really on the rise. TB we know is a disease that is there from eons together. In fact, the Egyptian mummies we found TB in them. So at least 5,000 years old disease we know. Treatment of TB has evolved over a period of years. Initially it was monotherapy with one drug in the 1960s. Subsequently went on to develop polytherapy. And now we are on to really many drugs because of drug resistance and drug treatment failure that is happening. Uh, not something to raise your hair about. But uh, we'll go on further, so we can sit tight and enjoy the session. Uh, some background for TB. When I went to the statistics of WHO, I was amazed at the statistics. Uh, according to them, one third of the global population is infected by TB. That means one third of the audience here already has a TB germ. That does not mean that everybody develops a disease. According to them, 8 million people will develop active disease every year and 2 million die. And maximum mortality is South Africa and India. Those are the only two main countries with TB. Now, my is of drug resistance. This is something that has evolved in the past one decade. And we've had drug resistance in approximately 50% China and India. And nearly half a million cases emerge every year. And we always think drug resistance, oh, that's an every problem. It's not the uh, pediatric problem, but that's not true. And uh, in fact, uh, Suji, my student, is doing a thesis on drug resistance TB, and we were amazed with the amount of patients that we could collect in the period of his thesis duration. Childhood TB occasion usually is due to contact with an adult, so it's not something that we get. We know it's something because they are in contact with an adult. So when would you suspect drug resistant TB? Either the contact has some features suggestive of drug resistance, or there are some features in the child that makes you suspect that this is drug resistance. Now, when do you suspect drug resistance in the contact case? When that contact is in contact with the drug resistance case, or the contact, the adult contact remains fusion positive in spite of therapy for the next three months, that contact was previously treated for TB, or he had treatment interruption, that means he had defaulted on his therapy. Those are the instances when you would consider drug resistant TB in the contact. When would you suspect it in the child primarily? When you in contact with such an adult, the child himself is not responding to anti-TB treatments and there is recurrence of treatment instead of being adherent to TB treatment. We see lots of, whenever we call up children in the TB clinic, we ask them to come back for another six months after completion of the therapy because the maximum relapse or the maximum recurrence is in the first six months after stopping therapy. Now, causes of drug resistance. There are plenty of causes, but the most important cause is inappropriate drug administration. Inappropriate drug administration may be because of the non proper guidelines. I think we had a lot many guidelines to follow and we got very confused. We had the IIT guidelines, which were a little different, we had the RNTCT guidelines, which were different. Then we have the DOTS, uh, I mean the WHO guidelines which are different, but luckily now all the guidelines suggest the same thing. So maybe now the confusion will be less and we will be sticking to one particular guideline for treating TB. When we start a patient on uh, TB therapy, most of the time we monitor them during the intensive phase. Once the consolidation phase starts, we tell them to come back after three months. Uh, I've seen uh, prescriptions by residents where they said, oh, six months are over, just stop the treatment. There's no monitoring done what has happened to the patient. Has the patient responded? Has the patient developed any side effects to the therapy? <laughs> uh, lots of 
sometimes drugs uh, are not available in the doc center because of uh, whatever logistic problems. So that may be another problem. Sometimes we end up getting wrong dose, wrong combinations. Patients themselves are not adhering to a therapy that is going to last for minimum six months. So that's another problem that is there and adverse effects, especially of the second line drugs that leads to poor intake. Now when we talk about drug resistance, there are four types that have been described. Monoresistance, polyresistance, MDR and XDR. Monoresistance is resistance to one antitubercular drug. Polyresistance is resistance to more than one other than INH and rifampicin. NDR is resistance to both INH and rifampicin. And XDR, this is what we are really worried about, is resistance to MDR, so it's resistance to INH and rifampicin plus a quinolone and plus a second line injectable drug apart from a streptomycin. So it includes your omicacin, capriomycin, canopycin. So any of these. So this is called an XDR. Now we have been facing a unique problem. We have been facing a problem where it's neither MDR, neither XDR. It's somewhere in between. Where we see patients who are resistant to INH rifampicin. They are not resistant completely to fluoroquinolone or aminoglycoside. But they are to one of them, either a fluoroquinolone or either to an aminoglycoside. So we have labeled this term as partial XDR. And uh, where we found either a fluoroquinolone or an amino glycoside resistance. Now, how do you confirm drug resistance? It's obviously a laboratory diagnosis. We can always suspect clinically that the diagnosis is always established on the basis of a laboratory. What are the types of tests that we can do for drug resistance? For any drug resistance, there are two types of tests. Either we do a genetic test, which is a mutation analysis. We check for a particular mutation that is taking place. Now this type of genetic test is usually done for HIV when we want to check for drug resistance. In TB, it's very difficult to do a genotypic test because we cannot correlate the mutation to a clinical phenotype. So even if I know this mutation has occurred, I don't know what that mutation is causing. Is it causing resistance or is it causing a better effect? So I cannot do a genetic test for a clinical picture of drug resistance. So in TB, we do a drug susceptibility test. So I grow the organism on culture. Tested on the various antibiotics and see what the MIC. So that is my phenotypic assay. So in TB it will be a phenotypic assay, whereas in cases of HIV it will be a genotypic assay. So are we more confused or are we uh, right there? Okay. Now before we go on to drug resistance, there are uh, classes of drugs that help us to determine how to treat them. All our first lines are grouped as group one. ATT because they are bactericidal. So your group 1 contains HRV, that is isomerizide, rifampicin, hydrogenamide, rifampicin. Your second group is the injectables. The second group is streptomycin, amigacin, canamycin, capriomycin. The third group are the fluoroquinolones, out of which ciprofloxacin is no longer recommended for treatment of TB. So ciprofloxacin is not considered as an antitubicular drug. We have ofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. Out of uh, the kind of uh, efficacy, the maximum is for moxifloxacin. Later comes your levofloxacin, and least uh, efficacy is ofloxacin. So even if I have a drug where a child is resistant to ofloxacin, the child will still be responsible to moxifloxacin or vatifloxacin. So these are the three groups uh, of fluoroquinolone. Then you have the fourth group. Now these are the bacteria studies. These are actually the drugs which may work, may not work, in which you have your isinomide, protonomide, cyclosidine and pass. These are the four drugs of the group four. And group five are the ones which can be tried as a salvage therapy in patients when nothing is working because their effect is really unclear. Of which you have clopazamine, linozolide, amoxicillin, and cabinetic acid, high dose, axonizer, <coughs> and even independent has been tried in thalassomycin. It's very important to remember these groups because your treatment is not going to be haphazard. I've had patients who've been started on levofloxacin with first line, so five drugs, and then referred, saying, oh, this is, it looks like MDR. And then I'm left with no choice because I've had the vinolones being knocked out. So there are very few drugs that I can actually use. Treatment of drug resistance, we have guidelines, but ultimately you will have to individualize according to the patient. It will be based on previous drug history, prevalence of the drug resistance pattern in the area that you see 
and the drug susceptibility report. Now this is a chart that is available for poly resistance. You can remember, you will see how confusing this chart is. This is not even MDR, this is not even XDR, this is just poly resistance DD, resistance to each particular drug and what is the suggested regimen. Most important to remember is that we have to use three to four drugs to which the child is susceptible. Try and use maximum first line drugs, so the maximum group one drugs, and you will have to give for a period of nine months to twelve months. So if you remember that principle of treatment, that three to four efficacious uh, drugs, you have to use drugs for at least nine to twelve months. So that becomes important. One thing that I want to highlight here is rifampicin. Most of the time when you have rifampicin resistance, uh, isolated resistance courses. So actually when you deal with rifampicin, it's most likely to be an MDR. That is why lots of drug tenders will actually be testing for rifampicin resistance. Because if we do a whole gamut of tests of 13 drugs, the cost is going to be something like 7,500. So you could do only rifampicin. If I have a rifampicin 